warm welcome to our sustainability webinar with D.B. Schenker and the Cluster Nordics for Ocean Freight. <clears throat> Today I have with me my colleague Sophie from Hamburg, Germany, our head office, together with me that will present our sustainability solutions in D.B. Schenker and also to give you insight, facts and um, knowledge about uh, laws and legislations, and also the sustainability solutions we can provide within the Schenker towards you. We already see a lot of challenges related to sustainability, related to climate changes. We also see new laws coming and legislation linked to fossil fuels and how to regulate and, and make a change in how we transport our goods uh, in the global environment. Transport in the global environment produces 16.2% of the global greenhouse emissions. This is accordance to our world in data as a source. The aim of international climate change policy is to limit the global warming to 2%. Currently, scientists say that we are with high likelihood to reach 1.5. Nobody knows what 2%, two, percent, clim uh, two, per two degrees uh, Celsius of global warming will mean to the environment, but we already see it today. Today we are between one and 1.2%, depending on the sources we look at, but we already see the larger impacts in our daily work, uh, daily lives. We see the extreme heats in the southern Europe last summer. We see the winter storms in Norway, my country, two in one week last week, which is extraordinary and extra uh, extreme. We see the extreme rain and in California. Just this week, we also have a new extreme um, storm. And I read in the news that they got uh, Fifty percent of their yearly rainfall for the two months, January and February, in one day yesterday. Also in Barcelona, to give another example of the current climate changes that we see in Barcelona, they have this week um, implemented water restrictions due to extreme heat last summer and lack of water. So the climate changes are around us. It's affecting us and it's affecting our daily work, meaning laws and legislations linked to how we transport and what fuel we are using when we transport. Also for ocean freight. Sustainable transport is more than the last mile. Last mile green transport is a super good uh, thing and, and uh, adds value to the environment. But we also need to look at other transport modes to make sure that we are doing what we can to affect the changes that we all are affected by in terms of global warming. At the COP28, there was an acknowledgement that the climate changes we see today are linked to the usage of fossil fuel. The agreement is that the world society will try and transition away from the usage of fossil fuels. This will affect ocean freight and containerized transport and the uh, energy that we need to, uh, to change for transporting our goods. One example is biofuel, which we will talk about today and give you more insight in what solutions we have within Schenker. We also see from the COP28 that the developed countries, as our Nordic countries, needs to take a larger part in this transition. That is why I thank you for joining our webinar today. Hopefully, Sophie now will give you more insights and good uh, tips and, and, uh, and um, solutions on how we together can change and do a difference for the transport of containerized ocean freight. Welcome, Sophie.
Hi, Christian, and hi to everyone out there taking the time today who dialed in and is interested in the topic. I'm very, very happy uh, to be here and I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Christian, for the invitation. So we're going to focus today on how do we decarbonize ocean freight and why is it even important to do so? Um, and with having said this, I suggest, given the uh, short time that we only have, I jump right into the topics. So. Emissions is clear and I think Christian said such a fantastic um, basis already on the topic that we are talking today about. But um, why is ocean freight actually important to you? So according to the greenhouse gas protocol, your company and you are accountable and responsible for different so-called scopes of emissions that your company is causing. Let's focus on the scope one and scope two emissions first. So let's say your company produces something in a manufacturing site or you also have your own um, cars or whatsoever. All of this is your scope one emissions. And also maybe you need to purchase electricity, energy, maybe in your manufacturing site, you need some heating and cooling activities. So that's also your indirect um, emissions, the so-called scope two emissions. With these kind of things, you own the activity, you own the process steps, so you pretty much have good access to the primary data and the related emissions all of these activities are causing. But also there is the so-called scope three emissions, and these are all of the activities that are in your value chain, and these can be differentiated into upstream and downstream emissions. And there we also have transportation and logistics as one of the category. In total, there is actually 15 categories uh, in the scope three emissions, and maybe you have also read on the news about the CSRD reporting standards coming up, etc. And all of these, especially for the larger companies, all of these 15 categories that are actually material for you and your company and your stakeholders, you need to report on. And in most cases, transportation, distribution, logistics activities is actually very material. So here's where we can where we can help you to first get transparency. And I mean, we don't just want to uh, report on emissions for the purpose of reporting, but to have the transparency to then also tackle them accordingly. So emissions from transportation and uh, logistics are calculated according to the so-called CLEC framework. CLEC framework stands for our Global Logistics Emissions Council. And I think it was 2014 when it first um, has been launched. And they have really developed a universal method for calculating logistics related emissions across all modes of transport, uh, transportation. And last year we have also um, changed or further develop the CLEC um, method to also become an ISO norm. It's the ISO 14083 in case someone wants to read it up. Um, and this is a good basis for anyone calculating the same way um, the emissions that occur from transportation logistics. Here I gave you just one example that shows how energy efficient ocean freight actually is in the first place. So I have selected with a tool provider, uh, I have selected one TU and we have transported it virtually from New York to Hamburg just to show how much more significant in terms of emissions air freight is compared to ocean freight. But then also sometimes I hear a lot of questions uh, around nearshoring and uh, hence I also put in the middle pillar the example of a trucking um, of the same um, uh, freight tons from Italy to Hamburg, just as an example. And what you can see is even though the distance from Italy to Hamburg, Germany is so much shorter, um, the energy efficiency and the emissions that we are causing is actually so much better on the ocean freight. It's because ocean freight is the best thing that you could do. So in the first place, switching anything from a different mode of transportation to ocean freight is already a first good step in reducing the CO2 footprint that you have. But yet we are hosting a webinar on decarbonizing ocean freight. Uh, if ocean freight is so great, we wouldn't have a need to have this webinar, right? But the problem is actually that that was a relative perspective that I gave you here. But actually, in absolute um, terms, ocean freight is still causing a lot of emissions every day. And why? Because all of the vessels are predominantly still running on fossil based fuels. And as we burn fossil fuels, we cause new emissions and these are being emitted to the atmosphere every day and these are just being added because co2 in the atmosphere 
hangs around uh, hangs around for quite quite some time and that's actually a problem that we need to get it out there again and we need to stop emitting and adding more to it so if we want to reduce emissions from sea freight we need to move away from fossil fuels and that's pretty much in line with what Christian shared in the beginning what has been discussed at COP this year as well uh, or last year <laughs> so this means we are looking at an energy transition also in our industry and sorry for the buzzword here in our industry, we have our eyes on two fuels in particular that are being discussed quite a lot lately, which is E-methanol and E-ammonia. Both are supposed to be synthetically produced and based on green hydrogen, and then we see some very good environmental benefits that are also scalable. But besides the fuel, and I will talk about the fuel uh, in a second a little bit more, besides the fuel, we also need a little bit more. We need the vessels that are being able to burn the fuel. So that means we need to look into all the books, retrofits and so on. But on top of that, we also talk about regulations that need to be established, especially, let's say, around e-ammonia. And also we need the infrastructure, the bunkering infrastructure in the port, etc. So you can hear there is still a little bit going on that needs to happen before we can at large scale access these um, these e-fuels. But I think current development shows that we can be very optimistic and look forward to it. But also we can still already do something today and we should not just lean back and wait for the market to do whatever the market does, but we can actively create the future ourselves. I brought you a very um, simple time uh, time lookout actually on um, these e-fuels. So as you can see, we can see that these e-fuels may only come at a larger scale as of 2030-ish. I don't have the crystal ball, but as sooner as possible, the better it is. But we can already now access biofuels, which serve as a great bridge technology actually until then. But give me one second um, to talk a little bit more, just one, two sentences about methanol and ammonia as well. So e-methanol is a marine fuel candidate and um, it's an energy carrier that bears rather low environmental risk compared to other potential risks such as e-ammonia. And it enables us to have a well to wake climate neutral operation if it is produced from renewable energy in the first place for the green hydrogen. And also, it because there you also need CO2 actually um, for the production of methanol, if these are also being sourced, let's say, from the atmosphere and taken out of it. And you see, there is certain things that will define how energy efficient the um, e-methanol actually will be. The main obstacle Thus is that we need a huge amount of renewable energy, not only for the production of green hydrogen, but also, let's say, if we talk about capturing the CO2 um, from the atmosphere in the first place. And this huge amount of renewable energy we don't have access to yet. E-ammonia is another future fuel candidate, and it is a carbon-free energy carrier. And that's actually why it's quite interesting. And maybe that also indicates that that will come at some cheaper costs. However, ammonia combustion will likely require a pilot fuel to facilitate the combustion in the first place. So we will probably look into those uh, dual fuel engines there. Um, ammonia is already today being used quite uh, a lot, not in the shipping industry, but for instance, uh, as fertilizers. So also here we need to talk about regulations to not uh, sacrifice any progress in the agriculture and food supply chain and so on. And also ammonia comes with another tricky thing, which is its toxicity, because it has quite a similar uh, toxicity, such as um, heavy fuel oils, and there needs to be a lot of regulations and maybe trainings, etc., around it as well. But luckily, we can access biofuels already now until we as a market sort out all of the rest um, to make us future ready in the e-fuel perspective. So biofuels are already available today. And let me walk you through a little bit how biofuels work before I tell you a little bit more what we have decided uh, at DB Schenker, what biofuel we use and want to offer you as well. So biofuels can be made from several different ways and from many different feedstocks. So what is basically the raw material that you take for the production of biofuel? And this then results in biofuels having different qualities and also maybe the uh, capability of how you mix it, etc. Biofuel sources come from agricultural main products. Um, 
that these are usually then referred to as conventional, but then there is also some that are termed advanced. So it really is in the detail here. What is a good biofuel? When we use biofuel in the combustion, we are still causing CO2 emissions, but only as many um, CO2 emissions as we have taken out of the atmosphere before. So we have a closed cycle. So Biofuel is based on plants and plants as they do photosynthesis, they consume CO2 from the atmosphere. So we take it out already from the atmosphere. Then the, um, these vegetables and plants are being used as, for instance, cooking oil in our case. So they have a first life. And then once it cannot be used anymore, it is basically waste. But instead of tossing it, we collect this waste and then we repurpose it and use it again um, and blend it into, um, into the bunkering process with conventional fuel that has a similar mix. And being able to blend it is actually very good. This is biofuels that we call drop-in fuels because we don't need large capital investments in order to use those biofuels. But there is one thing. So biofuels are based on biogenic waste. There is only so and so much waste. So the physical constraint of the amount of sustainable and suitable feedstock that we can access is limited. And thus, this is really just the bridge technology. And also, whoever moves first has a better position, actually, because then we have access to this great solution to already change and decarbonize today. The biofuel that we are using at Divyshenka Yukomi, and I will tell you a little bit more about it in a second, reduces the emissions um, by 84%. Why not 100% in the first place? Um, it's because we also, in a well to wake perspective, if we look at the full life cycle of the fuel, we need to acknowledge that collecting the waste, repurposing it, bringing it to the bunkering port, all of these activities cause emissions as well. So acknowledging this, we have an emission reduction potential of 84% by default by just using the biofuel. The remainder of 16% we can then further inset or offset um, in order to fully decarbonize if we want to. So I don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I just like it so much. So it's crazy, but in order to fuel those big container vessels out there, we are using used cooking oil. So what quality attributes does used cooking oil have? So the European Union has defined in its RED, which is the Renewable Energy Directive, different um, feedstocks that are suitable for biofuel. And we, access, uh, and we are compliant with this. The way we at Divyshenka access biofuels is by procuring the best possible quality from various um, shipping lines. And this multi-carrier strategy will enable us to always access the right amount and the best possible quality for your shipments. So if you were to decide tomorrow you want to switch your ocean freight to biofuel, we will be happy to support you in that, no matter how small or big the volumes we talk about. We also exclude any palm oil and palm oil residuals. This is the so-called PFAD um, regulation. We don't want to support by taking the waste from the palm oil industry and purchasing this and using it as a feedstock um, because this is indirectly supporting the palm oil industry as well. So we want to exclude that um, at any means. And then also as we speak agricultural products, of course, we don't want to have any direct or indirect um, land use change. That's the so-called ILUC regulation, I-L-U-C. I just mentioned already briefly uh, a second ago that we um, purchased the biofuel from shipping lines directly because that it has also an another um, advantage. The shipping lines are the ones that cause the scope one emissions in the first place, because as they are burning the fuel in their engines, they have control over their scope one emission reductions and that they can allocate these emission reductions to DB Schenker as a scope three reduction. This also ensures that there is no double marketing um, of these scope three emissions, because if I were to only purchase a scope three certificate on the market, we need to have insurance that these scope three reductions are not being sold multiple times. And this is why we chose the closest physical link that is possible. 
And then also shipping lines are already investing into biofuels, which is fantastic. But what we have asked actually the shipping lines to do is um, some to integrate some sort of additionality it means that any purchase of biofuel on behalf of DB Schenker comes on top. So we achieve an additional reduction in the market. And in order that we all do these uh, things that I just explained correctly, there is a triple certification uh, process in place. So the biofuel as such is being audited or certified. The shipping lines are being certified. And then we at DB Schenker go through an audit um, as well. And with this, we can then issue for the usage of biofuel. We can issue the declaration of biofuel usage and the related emission reduction that we have achieved with that, which you can then claim in your scope three um, carbon accounting as a reduction. A question I get frequently asked is, is my container really on the vessel um, where the biofuel is bunkered into? And the answer would be maybe yes, maybe no. And that is um, due to the mass balance um, system and also the book and claim how we account for it. So with the mass balance system, actually the chain of custody of the fuel as such, the shipping lines can plant the biofuel in suitable vessels at a certain amount. Um, once they have ingested it and they have actually um, achieved this emission reductions, we can make use of the book and claim framework, which is a voluntary um, insetting framework, to then claim these emission reductions for our respective container transportation, where we exactly know how much energy we um, we require and for how many CO2 emissions this stand. So this is a common practice and based on a framework um, in the market. Yeah, your decarbonization roadmap starts today, maybe. Um, you have probably maybe are currently doing so, or maybe uh, you will receive it soon. You have some carbon neutral, climate neutral targets, carbon reduction targets from your corporate sustainability team. Usually these targets are in 2050, 2045, 2040, depending how um, ambitious you are and what is also feasible and possible from your end. So as we speak today, we still have quite some time to go, but we need to get started and lay out this roadmap. So we really want to invite you to get in touch with us to quantify what is your CO2 footprint today coming from Ocean Freight and where do you need to be according to your corporate sustainability strategy that you need to achieve a target in 2050, 2045 and so on. Because with this, we can then uh, we can steadily increase the amounts of biofuel that we are applying to your ocean freight shipments. And we can also create some scenarios to consider your growth, etc. Because with this, we can then basically with every additional container that we are shipping on biofuel or eventually e-fuels, we can reduce your carbon footprint. And that is actually a journey we can do together and where we invite you to get in touch with us. Yes, biofuel comes at um, some additional charges. So biofuel or in general alternative more environmental fuel is a little bit more expensive compared to conventional fuel. And yeah, there is a price gap that we are closing and that also the, the regulations are currently trying to close with things like ETS. Um, however, if we break it down, actually, and we did the exercise with uh, one sample shipment um, where we really looked into also what actually is inside the container. And I chose um, actually um, a customer from Sweden and it was quite interesting. I did the breakdown and the additional costs for the investment of biofuel for one container, if we break it down per T-shirt, in this case, it was T-shirts inside the container, but you know best what you are loading. It was really just one cent that we speak. And if we break it down like this, I think we really have the business case. So actually these additional costs that might sound overwhelming in the first place are not that big anymore. Yeah, and with this, I'm actually coming uh, to an end of the slides that I have prepared. Um, so I think you had the chance to post your questions in the Q&A and I'm looking a little bit towards Christian virtually if there is some questions coming in. Yeah, Sophie, uh, there are uh, quite a few actually and there's still time to, to type in your questions if you have any. We still have time to, to answer them and this is a unique opportunity to get clarity and answers to your sustainable questions. 
The first question is, and you barely touched upon it briefly here, Sophie, is what is the ETS? Why and why do customers have to pay for it? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think it has been on the news since a few weeks and months now. Um, so that's quite interesting. So the ETS is the emission trading system from the European Commission. So research in general has shown that introducing a carbon pricing mechanism can help the industry to reach the emission reduction targets that we need to achieve. Um, in Europe, this would be the um, Green Deal. And a carbon pricing mechanism penalizes fossil fuel and um, incentivizes uh, the greener option, so to say. In the EU, um, we see the EU ETS. It has already been in place, so it's actually nothing new in general as such. But the emission trading scheme has now been extended since January 1st to also the shipping industry. The EU ETS is a cap and trade system. So what the European Commission does is it selects a certain industry that causes emissions and they say this is a maximum cap that this industry is allowed to emit within one calendar year. And every company who operates in this um, respective industry who is causing emissions, they need to purchase for every ton of emissions that they are causing they need to purchase an allowance and this allowance then needs to be surrendered and this is how the European Commission makes uh, sure that um, the maximum cap is not being exceeded. Shipping lines can now purchase, so to say, these um, allowances uh, on the primary market and if you purchase too many, you can even sell them um, on the secondary market and so on. What does it mean? Um, it now means that we are seeing an increase in costs because our industry as it is based on fossil fuels still and causing emissions gets more expensive. That's completely normal and we have seen it in other industries. It's just rather new now in our market. So right now we only speak in 2024 about 40% of the emissions that occur within Europe. Next year uh, we will increase the phase into 60% and then the following year in 2026 we speak 100% of the emissions. And also right now we only cover CO2 but then also we will soon see also methane and also uh, nitrox oxide being included as well. In parallel, maybe we even see something similar being introduced in the coming years by the IMO. I don't know for sure yet, but this is also what I read a little bit. So that basically means that everything that causes emission becomes more expensive. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Quite a lot of questions coming in. Uh, the next one is very uh, close to our current situation in the Red Sea. How does rerouting around the Cape of Good Hope instead of going through the Suez affect the total emissions for a voyage from the Far East to Northern Europe? Yeah, that's a super good question. I'm actually looking into this um, currently uh, myself. So it is not too easy to assume that the emissions race in parallel um, to the additional days of the voyage that we see, because every additional day um, on the waters means additional fuel being consumed, means additional, um, ad uh, additional emissions that we are seeing. However, our calculation method also wants to have some um, a, a robust um, calculation method means that we want to have actually a trustful standard within one year, which is usually based on the previous 12 months. So we don't see the effects now. However, we are currently looking into how we may want to adjust it um, accordingly. But it's not too easy to say. So we need to look at the vessels that are actually being rerouted. And then also we need to actually look into also the speed of the vessels because the speed um, in the end also determines how much emissions are being caused because it's the same with like uh, your car. If you go very fast on the highway, you need more or you burn more fuel. And if you go slow, then you don't burn as much fuel. So as the transit time increases between some, let's say 30%, then actually right now, this is also the most um, reliable, if you want to say so, number that we have, that it increases at somewhat like 30%. So this is what we have right now. I'm looking into it. And if you have a very um, specific question on your report, uh, please feel free to reach out and we will look into that. Thank you. 
Um, the next question is, um, when customers that are already running a carbon emission reduction program, such as the biofuel you just presented for us here in Schenker, will they still be charged with the EU ETS surcharge? Yeah, no. So that actually is exactly the price gap that we try to close with the ETS or that the industries or the politics are trying to close. So unfortunately, the, um, the biofuel costs are a little bit more expensive still compared to the ETS, just because the EU ETS is only 40% of the emissions. It's not that high yet as in the costs for it, because right now you can procure the allowances somewhere between 60 and 80 euros per ton of CO2. So there is still a price gap. What we will do is, of course, because we still want to incentivize everyone who is going to invest into the decarbonization of their supply chains. So what we are doing is we are deducting the ETS costs from the biofuel in order to make the biofuel cheaper for you. Thank you. The next is also uh, in reference to, to your presentation and it's, it's uh, the customer willingness to pay extra for biofuel and how much extra will the customers have to pay for biofuel according to your estimate? So this is back to the t-shirt example, I would expect. Yeah, exactly. So the answer is one cent. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So yeah, the willing or the price gap is for sure the biggest obstacle currently in decarbonizing. So yes, it comes at additional costs and I see more and more shippers being interested in the biofuel option, which is fantastic to see. And usually the biofuel option is being asked uh, us to provide the, the quotations in the tenders. And also um, besides uh, tenders, we are um, asked more and more for the solution and to look into the respective um, trades that uh, we are operating and see how what would be the cost. And maybe we only select one geography. So that's really fantastic to see. However, I do see that there is a certain um, or that there is some customers that are still hesitating on going that way. So I can only encourage everyone as we see that the re uh, regulations are stepping up. Um, I think it's actually better to be prepared to gain some experience with the processes, with the declarations, which you need to report to your um, CSRD reporting probably and so on to gain the experiences now and be prepared and proactive instead of reactive as the regulations come in. So please feel free to reach out every um, Supply chain looks different, so we will look into your specific trades and what it means and are happy to support you with some quotations also for the biofuel. Great. Uh, is it possible to get a calculation of the CO2 emissions for, for specific trade routes? So for a customer that has multiple trade lanes, as we call it, to get a, a specific emission report? Yeah, absolutely. Even if you do more than just uh, ocean freight uh, with DV Schenker, uh, we are happy to support you with all of the uh, transportation that you are doing with us. Um, we are happy to, according to the ISO standard that I mentioned earlier already, to produce those emission reports and share it with you as you need it, whether this would be monthly, quarterly, annually for your um, non-financials, probably especially now in the light of the CSRD, uh, this could be very interesting and relevant for you. So please feel free to reach out to either your Schenker counterpart you're anyway already in touch with or with Christian or myself. It's also a question about the ISO standard. So we refer to an ISO standard and the question is, which ISO standard are we actually talking about? <laughs> so it's a, <laughs> it's actually a rather new one. It's the 1408. Three, and this uh, really defines how we want to calculate transportation related emissions. Thank you for clarifying. Um, the next question is, is DB Schenker certain that there is enough maritime biofuel in the market? What is enough? <laughs> that is the question. So the last years we were able to have enough access to the biofuel that um, we needed to serve our customers who were willing to um, decarbonize their ocean freight. And also, of course, we are um, frequently talking with our shipping lines about this. So we have the access to it and we also um, did a lot of upfront investments there as well already. So 
please feel free uh, to reach out. Yes, it is only a limited heat stock or it is only a limited product by its nature, but um, we do anything to secure that we can plug and play the solution for you. That shouldn't be a problem. And the last question is, uh, do you offer different uh, shares of biofuel blends? And also, will this have an effect on the ETS surcharges? Yeah, I think the surcharge topic we um, touched on before. So um, we will consider exactly these costs in the pricing. So we don't have, um, so we make the biofuel um, cheaper of the amount that the ETS would cost. Um, and then, yes, of course, we can look into your um, into your trades that you are shipping and how much you want to do. So, of course, one point is to just say to each container that I'm shipping, I want to decolonize 50 percent. Or we could say 50 percent of all the containers, but these I decarbonize entirely. I think it's very individual and also it depends so much on your customers, geographies and um, industries, products, etc. that I suggest Jess, we really look in, into it case by case to find the best possible solution that works for you. But yeah, we can completely uh, look into that and find an individual perfect matching solution there. Thank you, Sophie. That was our last question. And thank you to all the uh, all of you that took the time dialing into our webinar. Thanks to Sophie. You make this difficult topic uh, easier to understand and also more graspable for how it will be uh, and can affect our day-to-day -day business going forward. So tomorrow there will be also an email sent out to you uh, that participated today. So please give us your questions and input on the webinar. Also, if you have further questions, please contact your local DB Schenker contact for further discussions on the biofuel and sustainability topics. And also, uh, Last remark from my side, please also use this uh, sustainability initiative that you have presented here as a, a competitive advantage. It will become more and more relevant for the end users and also for the uh, regulations that will come and uh, be more present in the transport uh, business going forward, not only in land, but also in ocean. So please challenge us in Schenker and together we can find sustainable solutions that will benefit us both and also the environment. Thank you for dialing in. Hope this was valuable.